House of Holland started in 2006 when I decided to make some t-shirts really for a laugh. My uh, company started on the back of a joke, which was uh, four slogan t-shirts with rhyming couplets on them, uh, which were uh, very heavily sexually laden. It started out really as a bit of fun, as a sort of side project alongside my job working in teen magazines, and very quickly became my full-time career. For the first collection of menswear, we've kept it completely separate from the women's wear collection because I wanted it to really affirm its own status as being a standalone collection whilst portraying the same DNA of the brand. I have a much more personal connection to the clothes as in uh, with each piece I design, I look at it as do I want that, is that desirable to me, can I see that as being fitting in as part of my wardrobe, do I want to buy that. So I think I have a slightly more commercial brain when designing menswear, as slightly more uh, restrictions in terms of silhouettes and shapes that you can explore. I think the inspiration behind our first collection was really just the customer itself, the House of Holland man. We looked at his characteristics, his pastimes, what he does, what other brands he wears, how he likes to uh, incorporate his personality into his clothes. Yeah, there's a real balance between this smart and casual world and the way that these pieces are mixed together to create a certain look. And, you know, he wears trainers and t-shirts with his suits and he wears his football shirts with, you know, a leather tracksuit, for example, just in the collection where we put it together. So it was really building up um, a collection almost as a wardrobe of pieces and then the way that those were paired together and styled is what created the character and the person that we were trying to portray. The, the menswear collection has, is, is referenced and has influences from my personal connections to menswear growing up. So like the football shirts I used to wear as a teenager um, and sort of the, the denim and the neon flashes of stuff I used to wear in the 90s and shouldn't have. Um, and so I thought it would be really fun to go back to my hometown um, of Ramsbottom um, and shoot it around the town and incorporate the town into the shoot because I felt like that was um, an interesting way of us portraying the clothes from a Martin perspective and he would be able to document the town and, and get the feel of that northern town. So I think there's so much about the humour to my work and the personality behind my work and what I really try and instill in it comes from my upbringing and comes from the place that I grew up and the people that I grew up with. And it was a little dull while we were there, but didn't it get brightened up by the characters of the people? Yeah. Everyone's got a sense of humour there and everyone's happy to take the piss out of themselves. And that's a really important part of my upbringing and that self-effacing humour that I think is very northern and very British. I managed to buy a print of his from a charity auction that Rankin had put on for Oxfam when I ran the marathon a few years ago. And then when I first met Martin, uh, he was talking to him about his fashion magazine, which I'd also bought from Colette a few years before. And, um, he was like, oh, it's a shame you don't have your fashion magazine with you, I could have signed it. And I pulled out my print from under the table and was like, I don't have my fashion magazine, but I do have this huge framed print, maybe you can sign that. And he was like, okay. The best thing about working with Martin was um, just being able to create imagery that is, for me, so iconic, but can, like, incorporate some of my work as well. Like him documenting my work is just a real honour, and I was really proud to be able to work with him. We started talking about working on it just with Martin shooting the collection and then that evolved into creating some of the pieces and um, using some of Martin's more um, iconic imagery. And it kind of evolved around this idea of how I wanted to present the collection. And that was um, as this kind of hybrid of, um, as, an exhi uh, as a photography exhibition private view slash static fashion presentation. So we're creating this space within the Selfridges car park to exhibit Martin's imagery and also exhibit the clothes. Hello, I'm Martin Palmer, photographer, and for the last few weeks I've been travelling around the UK, very often different community groups. It started off as a bit of a youth group, really, that just played rugby. So the, the idea was is to engage children, to get them off the streets and onto something constructive. I think people don't underestimate the positive impact sport can have on children. If it wasn't for sport now, I don't know what I'd be doing. 
I've made so many more friends just from rugby. It's made a big impact on my life. All these hundreds of kids have suddenly poured onto the school and it was absolute anarchy. And what I also liked was the fact that it was quite muddy and mud actually And I started the organisation in response to the needs of the young people in the community right. because young people were getting into trouble with the police. They had a fascination with fire. So I kind of figure that if young people wanted to play with fire, I would teach them to play with fire. What you could really see in this rather dingy area in South Wales, where there's not so much going on, especially for the young kids, the affection and the regard that they have for the organised chaos uh, workshops was quite fantastic. You could just sense it as you went in there. They just love being there. They put themselves into the 100% and they really let off steam. If I could go back and see myself, I first started juggling and just have a conversation. I just turn around and say, get ready, man. It's, it's, it's going to change your life. The Not Forgotten Association was formed in 1920 and it's been going 96 years. We entertain 12,000 veterans a year. For the veterans that come to NFA events, it gives them a day out or an afternoon out. It gives them the chance to meet fellow veterans, to renew old acquaintances, meet others from different associations and different services. Basically, it gives them a good time. You're looking all the time at the moments like this, where you get a little surprise in the photo, but it also tells you a story at the same time. go out and try and figure it off yourself. You have to go in close. Often people go too far away. And you have to identify, if you like, where the energy source is and then sort of concentrate on that. This is in Sheffield. This is the Loxley Silver Band. And I went to one of their rehearsals and this guy was doing a trumpet solo. And you can see the, the absolute concentration and the puff that you have to put in. So I focused on the fingers here and the rest of his face is all there, the detail, but it's slightly out of focus. So you really get a sense of that real hard work that has to go into playing a, a brass band instrument. I think the better pictures have a story within the, the single frame. You, you get a sense of what's going on, there'll be a contradiction there, there'll be a, a, a point that's being made through the photograph. And you can build up these little sections, if you like, of the narrative. And at the end, you have 10, 20 pictures that really do give a a sort of image of what this place was like and the, the sense of feeling and the excitement of being at that particular event. So this is organised chaos, they use a lot of things like trapezes, so that means that uh, during sort of free time they're often hanging upside down, so I was able to actually get these two kids who had a great relationship with each other and someone the right way up, so it just makes it look surreal. So you're looking all the time for little moments like this where you get a little surprise in the photo but it also tells you a story at the same time. I think my advice is take many more pictures, except that you have to take a lot of bad pictures, because if you just wait for the great moments, then you'll still lose momentum. Grenson is 150 years old this year, so it was started in 1866 by a guy called William Green. He literally started before the first factory. He was using outworkers and getting orders for shoes from uh, men in London, taking them back to Rushden, which is where we're from, um, and getting the shoes made. And that progressed to a small factory and then a bigger factory and then the factory that we were in for over a hundred years, which we've just moved out of two years ago. And we're now about less than half a mile from where his first ever factory was, but we're in a more modern building. However, everything about the factory inside is completely traditional. The machinery, the way we do things, the way the shoe's made. What was exciting about this is that we, we're in the factory almost every day and a lot of the things we see there we're very, very used to. Um, but to get Martin to come up and give his eye to what, what we see every day 
and his angle on what we see and the people um, and what he picked out of it was fascinating. I think in particular this whole thing about the man and the machine um, that we often don't really kind of notice but um, I get asked about it a lot, are the shoes handmade? And in true um, shoemaking terminology, handmade is literally without machines and there are a few people left and we still use it occasionally but this is a proper factory setting and this is the kind of factory that was set up in the Industrial Revolution and we're still um, doing things the same way now and it's this incredible combination of man and machine and everything is about hand-eye coordination. The machine can do nothing without the man and vice versa. You know, these people um, come to work every day um, in the same place and they work together, very closely together, um, and they make the place their own. It's really their second home. Um, and they also, because they're doing something which sometimes can be repetitive, although I think they get um, a lot of satisfaction from what they do because it's a high quality craft, they have this kind of humour that comes through to lighten up the day. Uh, and you can see that in little bits around the factory and Martin's picked a lot of that out in some of these pictures, little details, things that people have put on the wall maybe, or things that they've written somewhere, or the way they've kind of arranged their little area that they sit in. And the quirkiness goes in to the shoes and it goes into the brand, it's part of what we do. It's not just a boring product and, you know, kind of well-made. It's got a little more edge to it than that.